Today, engineering a boom or not. The Property Imperative Weekly, the 23rd of November 2019. Hello again, I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to our latest post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. In this week's digest, we look at the latest from the OECD, the Fed's non-QE QE, the risks to the German economy, and locally the contentions between the government's narrative, their actions, and the broader economic data. Wherever we look, we see various forms of intervention to try to prop up an economic boom, yet the outcomes remain concerning. And as normal, we'll start with the international context before we get into the local news. But if you wish to jump direct to the Australian segment, the time is shown below. We focus on the global scene simply because we are trade and finance exposed here. And so what happens over there has a significant impact here. And you cannot understand the Australian economy in isolation, although, I have to say, many still tried to do just that. Wall Street rose again on Friday, reacting to the on-again, off-again narrative that's been the consistent theme regarding a potential trade deal with China. In previous days, one report suggested the delay of a trade truce to 2020, while US lawmakers backed two bills backing protesters in Hong Kong. But US President Donald Trump told Fox News a trade deal was quote potentially very close following remarks by President Xi Jinping that Beijing wanted to work out an initial agreement. But remember that the trade talks are just that. And China's been saying that the two sides were talking but China is vowing to walk away if sovereignty is threatened. And President Donald Trump says talks were progressing, but he believes the United States would come out ahead. So it does see, really seem most likely that a deal isn't that near and that more tariffs will be imposed on Chinese imports starting on December the 15th. Although, of course, the stock market is clearly hoping for a phase one deal. Meanwhile, the latest economic data underscored a resilient domestic economy as US manufacturing output accelerated in November to its fastest pace in seven months and services activity picked up more than expected. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 0.39% to 27,873. The S&P 500 gained 0.22% to 3,110. And the Nasdaq Composite added 0.16% to 8,519. The S&P 500 and Dow broke three-day losing streaks and the Nasdaq indices moved up after two weeks of declines. For the week, the S&P 500, Dow and Nasdaq saw declines and the S&P 500's was the first weekly loss after six weeks of gains. The Dow's decline was the first after rising for four weeks and the Nasdaq's loss came after rising for seven straight weeks. In that time, the stock market hit record highs, but in the last week, it gave off signs it might be overbought. As it is, the averages are less than 1% below their record highs, which suggests that there is not a lot to worry about in the market yet. But the problem should be obvious. Since the federal government began ramping up debt and running an annual deficit, economic growth has continued to deteriorate. This is not just a coincidence. In recent testimony to Congress's Joint Economic Committee, Jerome Powell said the debt is growing faster than the economy. That's unsustainable. Some have suggested that because uh, uh, we in the United States, uh, that the United States government <coughs> borrows uh, in its, its own currency, it's, this level of spending isn't a problem because the Fed can just monetize the debt and keep doing so more or less indefinitely. Well, what's your reaction to that talk? Are there risks inherent in it? Yes, no, I, and I, as I mentioned in my, in my testimony, um, the fact that interest rates are lower does mean that we will pay less in interest. It does not mean that we can ignore deficits at all. Uh, we're, we're going to have to get on a sustainable path. What, what does that mean? So um, the debt is growing faster than the economy. It's as simple as that in nominal terms. And uh, that is by definition unsustainable. Ultimately, you will have to get it to, to where the debt is 
not growing faster than the economy. And it's growing faster in the United States by a, by a pretty significant margin. So even with lower rates and even with decent growth, <clears throat> there's still going to be a need to reduce these deficits. And in, in, I would say, by the way, that's, it, that's a need over time. You know, I'm, we're not in the business of advising you when to do that or how to do it. But it is inevitable that over time we will have to do it. And, and the, you know, frankly, if we don't do it, what happens is we'll, our children will wind up spending their tax dollars more on interest than, than the things they really need, like education, security, health. With the government already running a massive deficit and expected to issue another $1.5 to $2 trillion in debt during the next fiscal year, the efficacy of deficit spending in terms of its impact on economic growth has been greatly marginalised. John Maynard Keynes was correct in his economic theory for deficit spending to be effective, the payback from investments must yield a higher rate of return than the debt used to fund it. So two points to remember. Deficit spending was only supposed to be used during a recessionary period and reversed to a surplus during the ensuing expansion. However, beginning in the early 1980s, those in power only adhered to the deficit spending part. After all, if a little deficit spending is good, surely a lot should be even better. And secondly, deficit spending shifted away from productive investments, which created jobs like infrastructure and development, to primarily social welfare and debt servicing. Money used in this manner has a negative rate of return. The other point to consider is the measures the Fed have been taking via the non-QE QE repo measures. Providing ongoing liquidity has turned the inverted yield curve we had a few months back into a regular one, but the spreads between the 10-year and 2-year notes remains in the vicinity of only 15 to 20 basis points, and this signals that the bond market remains concerned about future growth, yet stock markets have taken up their late bull run in this manipulated environment. In fact, the amount of Fed intervention continues to rise to maintain the target Fed funds rate. Crude oil moved lower, down 1.08% to 57.95. Interest rates and gold were flat. And Bitcoin was down a further 3.59% to 7,365, with some analysts predicting further falls ahead. European shares recovered on Friday, as better than feared manufacturing activity readings from major eurozone economies outweighed concerns about the US-China trade deal that had sparked a sell-off earlier in the week. The pan-European stock 600 index added 0.44% and London-listed shares outperformed with a 1.22% rise on the FTSE to 7,326 as trade-exposed miners, banks and energy companies rebounded from sharp falls earlier in the week. And the election debate in the UK halted up with Labour going firm left and the Conservatives planning to spend big reversing the recent austerity drive. And Germany's DAX gained 0.2% after IHS Markets' final purchasing manager's index readings showed German business conditions continue to deteriorate in November, although more slowly than recently. Risk of a deepening German manufacturing recession amid a prolonged US-China trade tussle, a struggling car industry and uncertainties over Britain's departure from the European Union has worsened sentiment among European investors and the German Central Bank released their financial stability report and the risks to financial stability have continued to build up in Germany, the Bundesbank warned. One major risk highlighted by the Central Bank is that Germany's current economic slowdown, the result largely of unfavourable external economic developments, could turn into, quote, an unexpected economic downturn. The country's export-led economy has barely grown in the last five quarters as global trade has slowed. If the situation gets much worse, it could trigger a deterioration in the debt sustainability of enterprises and households, which in turn could lead to cascading loan defaults and credit write-downs. Many yield-starved banks have significantly expanded their lending into relatively high-risk businesses while simultaneously reducing their provisions against losses on lending. As the Bundesbank put it, there are signs that banks' lending portfolios now include a higher share of enterprises whose credit ratings could deteriorate the most in the event of an economic downturn. 
and the banks are also heavily exposed to the fast-growing domestic real estate market, one of the few in Europe to have avoided a slump in the wake of the 2008 crisis. Since then, prices have surged as investors, domestic and foreign, have poured funds into real estate and banks have shifted their focus towards property transactions. Last year alone, house prices in Germany grew at an average rate of 8% and the Bundesbank estimates that property prices in German towns and cities are overvalued by somewhere between 15 and 30%. And according to the 2019 Global Real Estate Bubble Index, housing in Munich is now the most overpriced in the world. Interestingly, the new European Central Bank President, Christine Lagarde, said the Eurozone needed to create more of its own economic growth at home, including via greater public investment, but did not discuss monetary policy in her first major speech. And meanwhile in China, the Wall Street Journal reported that Harbin Bank, a politically linked mid-sized Chinese lender based in the capital of the northeast province, became the latest Chinese financial institution to get a state bailout after its key private shareholders were replaced by government investors. Harbin Bank, which is one of the biggest banks in China's northeast, with 622 billion yuan in assets as at the 30th June 2019, and trading on a Hong Kong stock exchange, became the fifth bank after Boshang Bank, Bank of Jizhou, Henfeng Bank and Hen Shishan, Rural Commercial Bank, to be bailed out by the state. And will be 48% controlled by two government entities after six private shareholders shed their stakes, according to a bank statement issued late last Friday. And the OECD's latest report said that for the past two years, global growth outcomes and prospects have steadily deteriorated amid persistent policy uncertainty and weak trade and investment flows. They now estimate global GDP growth to have been around 2.9% this year and project it to remain around 3% for 2020 and 2021, down from the 3.5% rate projected just a year back, and the weakest since the global financial crisis. Short-term country prospects vary with the importance of trade for each economy, though. GDP growth in the United States is expected to slow to 2% by 2021, while growth in Japan and the euro area is expected to be around 0.7% and 1.2% respectively. China's growth will continue to edge down to around 5.5% by 2021, and other emerging market economies are expected to recover only modestly amid imbalances in many of them. Overall growth rates are below potential. And the mix between monetary and fiscal policies is unbalanced, they said. Central banks have been easing decisively and timely, partly offsetting the negative impacts of trade tensions and helping to prevent a further rapid worsening of the economic outlook. Thereby, they have also paved the way for structural reforms and bold public investment to raise long-term growth, such as spending on infrastructure to support digitalization and climate change. However, to date, they said, other than a few countries' fiscal policies have been only marginally supportive and not especially of investment, while asset prices have been buoyant. The biggest concern, however, is that the deterioration of the outlook continues unabated, reflecting unaddressed structural changes more than any cyclical shock. Climate change and digitalization are ongoing structural changes in our economies, they said. In addition, trade and geopolitics are moving away from the multilateral order of the 1990s. It would be a policy mistake to consider these shifts as temporary factors that can be addressed with monetary or fiscal policy. They are structural. And in the absence of clear policy direction on these four topics, uncertainty will continue to loom high, damaging growth prospects. Hi, it's Liz Interruption, but if you're getting value from this post and have not done so, please consider subscribing to this channel or ring the bell for custom alerts. Plus, please consider supporting our efforts. You can make a one-off donation via PayPal, here's the link, or subscribe via Patreon for as little as $3 US a month or more to get access to exclusive additional content. Alternatively, you can also donate using Bitcoin. Here is the QR code. The links are in the comments below. I really appreciate your support, which enables us to continue to make more great content. Thanks very much. Now, back to the current show. 
And so to the Australian news, where the OECD says Australia's projected growth is to firm at around 2.25% in 2021, while weaker trading partner growth and a downturn in domestic dwelling investment will weigh on economic conditions, recent household tax cuts and monetary policy easing should provide some support to activity, they said. Subdued output growth and lingering uncertainty will weaken the recent strong labour market conditions. A monetary policy is accommodative and the central bank is projected to make a further cut in the policy rate in its attempt to achieve the inflation target. Macroprudential policies may need to be tightened if lower interest rates fuel house prices, which will create imbalances and expose the economy to downside vulnerabilities. And fiscal policy, which on current plans is expected to exert a broadly neutral influence, they said may need to play a more active role in strengthening economic growth. Economic growth has moderated. Housing investment activity has slowed in response to past declines in property prices, with a continued slump in dwelling approvals, indicating further weakness ahead. Private business investment in the non-mining sector has also eased, with a slowdown in the global economy and domestic drought conditions reducing exports and business confidence. And employment growth has been surprisingly robust, given the modest pace of output growth, and is encouraging higher labour force participation. Despite this, they say, private consumption spending has been sluggish, weighed down by slow wage growth and increase in taxes paid by households. The stance of monetary policy has become more expansionary, with cuts to the key policy rates totaling 75 basis points since May 2019. Both business and household credit growth remains modest. However, house prices in some major markets have begun to rise again, and high household indebtedness means that the authorities should stand ready to tighten macroprudential policy settings if lower interest rate fuels house price inflation through a sharp pickup in credit. Fiscal policy is expected to provide little support to economic growth in accordance with the federal government's commitment to future budget surpluses and the rollout of government service under the National Disability Insurance Scheme and recent tax cuts for low and middle income earners should provide some support to household spending and reduce income inequality over the projection period. Nevertheless, a more expansionary fiscal stance may be warranted given that the economy is growing well below its potential and the relatively low public debt burden. The government should consider further public investment in green infrastructure and bringing forward shovel-ready capital projects from the government's infrastructure investment program. At the same time, growth-enhancing tax reforms should be prioritised. These include shifting the tax mix away from direct taxes and inefficient taxes like real estate stamp duty to the goods and services tax and land taxation. And the economy will grow at a stable rate. Export growth will decline in line with the slowdown in major trading partner economies and this will continue to have an impact on business investment, though mining investment has now troughed and will gradually rise over the objection period. Given the outlook for GDP growth, the unemployment rate is unlikely to decline much further and inflation will remain below target. As a result, the central bank is projected to provide further monetary policy stimulus. The risks to the economic outlook are tilted to the downside. As a small open economy, Australia is particularly exposed to the global growth slowdown. Investment activity is moderated in China, Australia's main trading partner and trade policy tensions are further threatening economic activity in the region. High indebtedness of the household sector could exacerbate the transmission of an economic shock. In contrast, an easing in global trade policy tensions could improve consumer and business confidence with positive effects on spending activity. But the six-month annualised growth rate in the Westpac Melbourne Institute Leading Index, which indicates the likely pace of activity related to trend three to nine months into the future, lifted despite a slight improvement in the month. The lending index growth rate remains materially below trend and continues to point to weak economic momentum carrying well into 2020. This below trend theme for the Australian economy is consistent, they say, with their current forecast for GDP growth in 2020 of 2.4%, compared to a trend growth rate of 2.75%, the Reserve Bank has recently released its revised forecasts for 2019, 2020 and 2021, and it's maintained its view that 
year-on-year -year growth in 2020 will return to trends at 2.8% for the first calendar year since 2016. The main differences between the Westpac and the RBA are around the timing and extent of the recovery in residential dwelling investments and the outlook for business investment. Westpac are broadly in agreement that another below trend year for household expenditure can be expected, with the outlook particularly dependent on policy responses and the risks being to the downside. The Roy Morgan Inflation Expectation Index measures what Australians believe the future trajectory of prices will be over the next two years. In October, price expectations tend to to be higher in country areas at 4.3% than in the capital cities at 4%, with this gap most pronounced in Victoria at 4.8% compared with 4.1%, New South Wales 4.3% compared with 3.8%, and Western Australia at 4.1% compared with 3.6%. But all of these are above wages growth currently in the moment suggesting that households will continue to go backwards in real terms, and there is little suggest here income growth will accelerate from this point. And NAB highlighted that the household debt to income level is now above 200, a record and one which is hardly high anywhere else, as mortgage lending is pumped up again to drive growth. Households are walking into ever more uncomfortable areas as incomes remain compressed and costs continue to rise. And CoreLogic published some worrying information on housing affordability. They said that the decade ending in June 2019 has seen the national median dwelling price rise from $382,000 to $516,000, an annual increase of around 3%. At the same time, household incomes, according to estimates from the ANU Centre for Social Research and Methods, which, by the way, I think may overstate the case, have risen as an annual rate of 3.1%, up from 59000 per annum in 2009 to 79800 in 2019. And over the same period, average mortgage rates, according to RBA statistics, fell from 5.1% in 2009 to 4.1% in June this year. And they say the wash-up from all these movements is that housing affordability based on the ratio of dwelling values to household income is broadly unchanged across Australia, and households generally are dedicating less of their income towards servicing a new mortgage. Nationally, the ratio of dwelling values to household income has varied over the past decade, moving through a low of 6.1 in late 2012 to a recent high of 7 in early 2018. In 2019, the ratio was recorded at 6.5, which is equivalent to where it was in 2009. A ratio of 6.5 simply means that the typical Australian household is spending 6.5 times their gross annual household income in order to purchase the typical dwelling. While most areas have seen housing values become more affordable relative to incomes, some areas have seen affordability worsen. Sydney, Melbourne and Hobart have seen housing values rise at a faster rate than household income, which has eroded affordability. And the typical Sydney household is now spending 8.2 times their gross annual income to purchase the median dwelling up from 6.6 times 10 years ago. Melbourne households are spending 7.2 times their annual income, up from 6.4 in 2009, and Hobart households are spending 6.5 times, up from 5.9. And it's a similar story with mortgage serviceability. Despite mortgage rates falling to the lowest levels, at least since the 1950s, households in Sydney, Melbourne and Hobart are generally dedicating a larger proportion of their incomes towards servicing a new mortgage than they did in 2009. Based on the proportion of household income required to service a new 80% loan-to-value ratio mortgage, Sydney households are dedicating 43.7% of their gross annual household income on mortgage repayments, compared with 377 10 years ago. When mortgage rates were around 9% in late 2008, Sydney households were dedicating a much larger 54.2% to service a mortgage. Melbourne households are dedicating 38.4% on average to servicing a mortgage, up from 36.2% in 2009. And Hobart households spent an average of 34.3% of their income on the new mortgage, compared with 33.8% 10 years ago.
So they said, although housing affordability has worsened relative to 10 years ago in Sydney and Melbourne, the decline in home values together with a substantial rise in household incomes and lower mortgage rates has seen affordability and serviceability record a temporary improvement in some areas. Since June, dwelling values have surged higher, while income growth has remained sluggish, implying that the improvement in housing affordability that has been delivered via a fall in home values is now being eroded. Home prices raced ahead this week, according to CoreLogic, with Sydney prices now up 6.35% over the quarter. Compared with REA's 0.8%, as we discussed in our post, the fishy assassination of Australia's property price debate. But the evidence is mixed. For example, houses in Cronulla are up an average of more than 14.5% over the past year, according to CoreLogic, but units in Ride are down by roughly the same amount. So the question becomes, how do these indices cope with such big swings and on such low volumes? Auction clearance rates came in at a weighted core logic average of 70.1%, with Melbourne at 74.3% above Canberra and Sydney. Total listed auctions were 2,590, compared with 2,571 a year ago, and with 1,491 cleared last year, compared with 1,598 cleared this year, which is 61.7% versus 58% last year, nothing close to the 70.1% that they claim. And we have others who also have been running calculations on clearance rates and coming out with lower numbers too. And there'll be more on this in a separate later post. So on to the markets. The ASX was up 0.5% on Friday to 5,561, while the volatility index was down to 11.14%, and down 4.13%. While most banks were higher, Westpac was down 1.55% on Friday to 2477, and down 6.98% over the week, and down more than 14% over the month. Weak results and the current Austrac issue highlight significant risks in the bank. Some analysts have written their fair valuations down by 10% because of the continuing issues. These contraventions are the result of systemic failures in its control environment, indifference by senior management and inadequate oversight by the board, the Austrac statement reads. And the regulator, of course, took CBA for $700 million in 2018 for fewer offences. Westpac's two billion capital raise is starting to make a lot more sense now. The Aussie US settled at 67.86 as the US dollar strengthened. The Euro Aussie cross was down 0.29% to 1.6242, and the Aussie gold cross was down to 2154, and the Aussie Bitcoin cross was down 3.09% to 10914. Finally, in this coming week, RBA Governor Philip Lowe will be speaking at the annual ABE dinner in Sydney titled Unconventional Monetary Policy, Some Lessons from Overseas. And this will be streamed live on the 26th of November at 8.05 p.m. via the RBA site. This will help us to read how monetary policy may play out, but many are expecting quantitative easing to become a critical element in the policy ahead as rates are pushed lower into a zone where negative rates may come into play. So reflect on this. The FT reported that a cooperative bank has become the first German lender to pass on the cost of negative interest rates to new retail customers with small deposits in the latest sign of how European Central Bank's policies is upending the country's banking sector. Volksbank Fürstenfeldbrück, which is located 30 kilometers west of Munich, and has just 1.8 billion euros in assets, said it will collect a depository charge of minus 0.5% on instant access savings accounts with deposits of one euro and above. Although over a fifth of German banks are already passing on the cost of negative interest rates to new retail customers, the pain has so far been confined to those with very large deposits, and the first 100,000 euros has typically been spared. Negative interest rates have now reached the average saver, said Oliver Mayer, chief executive of Verinox, an online portal that compares the terms of instant access savings accounts offered by 800 German lenders. And here in Australia, 
Banks are rushing to make system changes to accommodate similar deposit features because many systems currently cannot support negative rates on savings accounts and of course the cash ban is still in review in the Senate. But all the evidence from around the world indicates that negative rates do not engineer a boom. Rather, they rip off savers and blow up asset prices and debt. And as Powell said, debt growing faster than growth is a recipe for disaster down the track. So the question is, will the RBA really be so stupid? Well, quite possibly. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.